Chicago. Hi there, South. You're on the air, WLS. Hello, Bob. Hi. Yeah, hi. My name is Marion. I just want to tell you that I agree with you wholeheartedly and have been for the last 30 years. I am 62 years old. I believe in capital punishment for these behemoth crimes. Well, you don't agree with me. I do agree with you. No, you don't. I don't agree with capital punishment. You do not? No, well, no. I do. And as far as those slashes were concerned, like cutting those girls in the face, I believe they should throw the book away on them. And I just saw something in my neighborhood similar to that. About 30 young men jumped on one man, and it was terrible. This, is, this, this society is just sick. And I believe that they should. I believe in capital punishment. For murder, for raping of murder and rape, I believe they should just go back to the rope. Well, I believe in throwing away the book. You and I are quite quite on the same road there. You see, I, I don't think there's any such thing as deterrence for people I who do that either. kind of nonsense. I don't believe in psychiatry. I don't believe in that. I remember reading in a history book when I was in grammar school, they used to throw people that minds were gone that far to throw them in snake pits. So I believe they should start using some of these old oak trees and throw some ropes over them and get rid of this trash and stop taxing people to death to feed them and try to rehabilitate them because I don't believe in it. And thank you very much. Okay, snake pits. All right, what the hell. Uh, off it is to Gary. Hi, Gary. You're on the air at WLS. Hello? Hello, Gary. Yes. Uh, oh, hi. you got to listen to the I phone and the not the radio. I the one that wanted to throw the rope over the trees and hang everybody and get rid of them. Uh-huh. I wonder if she, if, if, if she can, can can tell me that, uh, you know, there were lynchings in, in the South for years. Has any white ever been convicted of a lynching in the South? Yeah, I believe some have, not too many. You can you can actually document that and and and, and say you know give yeah, the name. Some have no no I can't I'll, give you that. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know you were going to call today so I didn't I'm bring not, my history books with me. I'm not for the young ladies who who did what they did. I hate that. I'm an ex police officer. I hate crime, but crime is rampant in every community. Well, what's that mean? Some of it's not being some of it's not being reported. So you know. So so what does that have to do with tough sentences? What does that have to do with tough sentences? A hell of a lot tougher than this girl got. A tough sentence? Yeah. You know, because crime isn't being reported in some neighborhoods. What does that have to do with this girl not getting a hell of a lot tougher sentence? Okay, well, they, they, uh, this young boy that was, uh, his father tried to set him, off, uh, set him on fire, pour k- kerosene over while he was sleeping, set him on fire, tried to kill him, and uh-huh. he got out of jail in, what, six years, seven years? Yeah, real travesty, real travesty. This kid will never, ever be the same. I, I, I appreciate that. But I still don't understand what that has to do with this girl not getting a hell of a lot tougher sentence. Because one jerk didn't get a tough enough sentence doesn't mean another jerk shouldn't get a tough sentence, does it? No, it does not. Okay, uh, good. Well, we agree on that. Off it is to Burr Hi, Burr. You're on the air at WLS. Hello? Hi. Uh, my name is Bill Bob. It's the first time I've listened to you, uh, and I think you got it done. Uh, hi there, Bill Bob. And uh, I just want to comment. You had that attorney on earlier. And uh, he, I believe in everything he was saying, except he just kept uh, uh, constantly saying that, okay, one of these young people, uh, oh, yeah, well, if he's young enough, he can be re- rehabilitated. And, you know, you're talking some vicious crimes. Now, I'm just going to give you one little for instance, okay? During the summertime, uh, I like to bike ride. And I was bike, bike riding through Brookfield, and they got a wooded area there. Now... I was maybe eh, a quarter of a block behind some other people. And all of a sudden I saw pieces of wood like being thrown in front of the bike. And uh, I told my buddy, we're riding together. I said, hey, watch out. And all of a sudden we Good get there, sure us. enough. Okay? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to keep up the conversation like this, but uh, all of a sudden, sure enough, they threw it a couple more. So I got off the bike. I said, hey, uh, what the heck do you think you're doing? I said, you can kill somebody with that. And here's a kid now. I mean, this is a kid. He couldn't have been more than 13, 14 years old. He cussed me every word you can think of in a book. And I said, why, you little runt, you. I says, who do you think you're talking to? And he says, go ahead, old man. He says, do something. He says, I'll sue you for every penny you got. Now, here's a kid. And they're saying that they don't have that type of intelligence to 
uh, you shouldn't do this to him. You shouldn't give him sentences. I'm just saying that I agree with what you're saying. There should be stiffer sentences and stiffer penalties. Thank you very much. To the south side we go. Hi, South. You're on the air, WLS. Yes. Hello? Hi. Yeah, I'm talking, I was calling in regards to that, uh, about the south side white girls that were attacked, were slashed by that black girl. Yeah. Well, what's interesting for me is, and I've lived in Chicago all my life, I can never remember where the press has suggested that it's racially motivated with uh, a black and white crime. Usually they say for no apparent reason or some unprovoked attack. They do? Yes. Oh. And like I said, I, I've been looking at the newspapers all my life on television. And, uh, well, apparently, I haven't been looking at them closely enough. There's, there's no doubt about this being a racially motivated attack. Well, that's what I said. This is the very first time. Now they seem to be backing off. And when the incident was happening, it, it almost, the press almost turned into a bus driver issue where, well, the poor bus driver is going to get persecuted over this because he didn't stop the bus. No, I think there's a great deal of criticism uh, against the bus driver. Great deal of criticism. Right. But then they went, and they, uh, went out and they interviewed his, his, uh, you know, his fellow employees. They were sorry about it. They turned it into a bus issue when they should have been turning it into a racially motivated issue. I mean, this is, this is what makes you into a racist. They never tell the truth. The press never tells the truth. So, so let me see if I have this correct, because the, tri- the press doesn't tell the truth. It's okay for you to hate niggers. I never said that. Well, I'm you said that's what turns I, people I, into racists. You're, you're putting words in my mouth because I do not. Well, you said that's what turns people into racists. Right, not me personally. Oh, okay. Other well, people. Why does the press ever care about this issue? Or any of these issues? Uh, how do you know the press isn't there? Because they never report as racially motivated. Mm-hmm. Ever. You mean to tell me in the history of the well, well, never had a case of black and white press? I, I beg your pardon, you just already admitted that this one they did. This one they did, but then mm-hmm. they, they totally backed off on it. They're not reporting they backed off on it. You you didn't report it as now. What do you mean I didn't report it now? Being a racist doesn't mean you hate black. Well, what what didn't I report? You didn't say that this was a racially motivated attack. Like uh, I believe said, I believe you know, I did, sir. When a black uh, excuse me, I believe I, excuse me, I believe I did, and I believe I took it even a little bit further than that Why by saying hear? something to you didn't hear. You're didn't going hear? You, you're going to tell me I didn't say something that you didn't hear? I said I didn't hear at the beginning of the show. Well, it wasn't the beginning of the show, sir. It was when I mentioned it at the beginning of this hour. Well, you're to be commended for that because I'm here to... Well, then why are you condemning me, sir, for not saying what I said? You, you, whether... You, and not even knowing whether or not I said it. Did you report it as racially motivated? Well, you just told me I didn't. What do you think? Well, I didn't hear you say it. Oh. You didn't hear me say well, it, but, but you're, you didn't hear... You weren't around to hear what I said, but you're sure of what I said. Did you, did you report it as racially motivated? Do you feel it was racially motivated? Sir, you're an idiot and a moron. Well, so you won't say it, so you're not telling the truth. Sir. You're people... just like the rest of them. Sir. What, what, what sir. are you afraid of? Uh, sir. Poor bus driver. That's what you're afraid of. Uh, no apparent reason. Sir. Unprovoked attack. The same old baloney. Sir. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, uh, sir. you're all the same. You all come from the same boat. Uh, sir, I've already you're answered your question. What are you afraid of? Sir, I've already answered your question once. You were just too stupid to hear the answer. You're just because you don't want to hear the answer, you just go sir. Go along right with the ball game. Oh, I go along with the ball game. Yeah. Really? That's right. Funny, I'm always accused of not being a team player. Well, in this case, you're not. Oh, even though you don't know what I said. Tell me when the last time you saw a case in the newspaper or on television where a black attack to white was what's called racially motivated. December the fourth. Pardon me. December the fourth. That's the very first time that they suggested. It. Why isn't it the top of the news right now? Racially motivated attack. Well, because most stories don't stay in the news for a month and a half. What's in the news today? In I mean, they're, you know, they're not even. T- they're, <clears throat> there's won't even be anything in the news tonight about about the Holocaust. Well, was it racially motivated? Yeah, for a while, you know, it's not news anymore. Do you feel it was racially motivated? Sir, I've already answered your question. No, you haven't. It, yes, I'm I have. You right now, was it racially motivated? I've already answered your question. You insult You're me by continuing to answer to ask you questions that I've like answered. The rest of them. Uh, for no apparent reason. Just like the rest of who, sir? I am for no apparent reason. Just like the rest of who, sir? Just, just like the rest of who, sir? Me a honky, just like the rest no of who, sir? Are, right? are you suggesting, sir, that I'm just like the rest of the media who hates white people? I didn't say that. I'm saying... Well, then what fair. are you saying? I'm saying be fair about it. What are you saying? I'm saying be fair about it. Well, you said it. I'm just like the rest of them. What do the rest of them do? They ignore the issue. Ignore the issue, really? Right. 
Huh. When a black person attacks a white person, it's for no apparent reason an unprovoked attack. Well, sir? But if there's a slight hint uh, sir? of a white person attacking a black person, uh, it's sir? automatically referred to as racially motivated. Sir, if they ignore these issues, how come you hear about them? When in reality... Where do you hear about them, sir? Do you, do you, normally, go down to the, do you normally go down to the police station and check out the blotter every night, or do you watch the news and, and read the newspaper? Hey, I open up my eyes. I don't live out... Open up your eyes. I see. You drive up and down the streets. Checking out crimes hey, listen, yourself. I'll tell you something right now. I don't know of any white person, a friend, family, or whatever, that hasn't been attacked by a black person either verbally You don't know of physically. any white person who hasn't been attacked by a black person. That's right, either verbally or physically. Son of a gun. Hey, well, that's the truth right there. And I'm, huh. glad, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the time to say it because the newspapers won't print it. Oh, sir. And nobody in my family well, there, There's a reason why they don't Let print it, sir. Them. I live in the south side of Chicago. I don't live in some hoity foity uh, north, northern suburb. Uh huh. I can I'm tell that. Like this. Nobody in my family hasn't been victimized by black people, okay? Mm. Victimized by black people? That's right. Uh, like, because like of their race. Like how? How have they been victimized? My wife used to get rocks thrown at her going to school every day. Huh. Why? Because she's white. Because she's white. Right. Huh. How do you know that? To check with the black people? Because you want to talk to her right now? No, I'd like yeah, to talk to you. I'll get you an apartment. Where do you live, by the way? Where do I live? Yeah. What makes you think I'm stupid enough to give you my address? Now who's, now who's talking stupid? Well, the same person that has been from the beginning of this conversation. That hasn't You're the changed. You're same kind of guy that tells me that I can't defend myself with a handgun, right? Defend yourself with a handgun? That's right. Well, you can defend yourself with a handgun, sir. If you're fit to own one. But when you make wild and... An incredible statements like all incredible white people statement. are victimized uh, by black people. Like the rest of the Seems to me to be the kind of guy that wouldn't fit on a handgun. <laughs> yeah, why don't you come over here and live with us in Chicago Lawn? I have a very nice apartment, sir. Thank you. I appreciate the kind offer, but yeah, when it comes down to nitty gritty, apartment's green, rather large and Muffy and I are comfortable in it. You live uh, up in the northern suburbs somewhere, right? Mm, no, I don't live in the northern suburbs, right. sir. Okay. Yeah, do you have blacks on your block? How many Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and uh, Arabs yeah. you got on your block? There are blacks in my building. All right, high-income blacks, too, I suppose, huh? Well, I don't and know. I've never asked them how much they right? make. At a very limited basis. I don't believe you for a, for, a, for a minute. You don't believe me what? What you're saying. What I'm saying. I just told you there are blacks in my building. How many you got on your corner? You think, they're, you think I'm lying about how blacks in my you building? Your are they right to six all over your uh, garage? No, I don't have a garage. Right. Are they climbing all over your car? No, I, my car's not out on the street. You're living in some kind of unrealistic world. So when it comes down to the real world, you don't know where you're at. The real world? I live in an unrealistic world? You know, you still have not asked answer my question. Is it, was that racially motivated? I answered the question the first time you asked it. Oh, again? I can't help it, sir, if you have a very short attention span. You don't even admit it. I don't have to admit anything, sir. You're afraid to answer it. Sir, sir, sir. Because you feel... Are you... Do you really think, sir? Do you really think that you are my... Sir, do you really think you are my verbal equal? I'm afraid of a question from you? You're afraid of a liberal threat. Afraid of a liberal threat? I'm afraid of a liberal threat. I'm afraid of a liberal I am a well-known Negro lover. Pardon? I love Negroes very, very much. I hate all white people, sir. I am, there is nothing that a Negro could possibly do that I would find objection to. Murder, rape, mayhem makes no difference, sir. I will bend over backwards because I just love Negroes. I don't have any problem. And I hate all white people. And yes, sir, I am terrified of the liberal press, which is why I say I love Negroes and they can do no wrong in my eyes. Oh, you don't believe me, sir? You're fine. You said no question. I just answered your question, and now you're telling me I didn't answer it truthfully. Okay, sir, if it'll make you happy, I will change the answer to the question. You think my answer was phony. I despise all Negroes, sir. There is nothing a Negro can do that, in my humble opinion, is worthwhile. No matter if they discover the truth in spurs or commit mayhem. Now, you can choose either one of those answers, sir, but I have to go on and take care of business. There's a winter storm watch for late tonight and tomorrow. I don't know what kind of call. Cloudy with snow developing tonight. Could be mixed with rain, snow, windy, and colder tomorrow. And over We're tomorrow. hearing right now, call 591-8900 on WLS Talk Radio 890. Now, more of Bob Lasseter. I know that right now there are three calls waiting for the general manager. I'm not sure exactly which order they will come in, but the three calls will be this. The first one will, will say, 
He, he just said he hates white people. He's a racist. He should be taken off the air. The second call will say... He just said he hates all the Negroes. He's a racist. He should be taken off the air. And the third call will say... He just said he likes egrets. Doesn't he know that they're, they're an endangered species? He should be taken off the air. What I love about this business. To a car phone, we go, hi, car, you're on the air at WLS. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I was listening to this, and uh, when you were talking about the, how the media represents things and doesn't tell the whole truth, and I'm not getting into the... Beg your pardon, I didn't say anything of that no, uh, anything the other time. Was. Oh, okay. And you were, you, know, you were sort of saying that, in general, that's not the case. Uh, although I do happen to agree with him that it does happen, I don't agree with the, the statements he was making it directed to. Well, what I have said before, and I'd be delighted to say it again, is that all too often the the media bends over backwards to uh, foster the to, to foster the impression that the black community is not quite exactly what it is, and that is a real shortcoming on the part of the media. It is done with the best of intentions. No, I I didn't. Uh, like I said, I'm not uh, getting into the black part. Uh, I was just talking about the media, and then you were talking, and you made a comment that kind of offended me slightly, like very much, was when you said, well, you're the kind of character that deserves a handgun. I wish you would be characterizing, you know. No, I believe I said that was quite the opposite. It was the kind of character that shouldn't have one. Okay, I must have misunderstood that. Oh, I misunderstood. No, I don't think you should. is one that I have found to be very misrepresented in the media, or at least one-sided represented. Well, he's the one that brought it up, sir. He, he, he's the one that brought it up. He said to me something to the effect of, uh, I probably wouldn't want him to have a gun to defend himself and his family. And I said that I really thought that he should have a gun to defend himself and his family, provided he were uh, of the, the, the caliber of person that should have a gun. Well, that, that may be. I, there are many people who shouldn't. But I've seen the media mischaracterize things. Uh, one of the things that really worries me the most is, like, there's a big issue still going on right now about these um, assault weapons, okay? And they should not be hit by everybody, just like a handgun should or anything. But the point is, is the way the media has characterized them, 90% of the people I've talked to about it think that we are talking fully automatic machine guns, because that's what they're called in the media. Yeah, well, you can't buy them, too. No, you can't. Oh, can't and, you? You can't buy an Uzi, huh? That's what can't buy a Thompson machine gun, sir? Pardon? You can't buy an Uzi or a Thompson machine gun? Not a fully automatic machine gun. Sure you can if you have a federal license. Not in Illinois. If you have a federal Not license. A private citizen. If you have a federal it's license. Been regulated for over 20 years in the state of Illinois. Check into mm -hmm. it. Well, if you have a federal license throughout most of the country, so Only you can. Dealers. Only dealers that supply to the police and military. Mm -hmm. In the state of Illinois, that's a state regulation. Fine, sir, but throughout most of the country, you can. Well, in places, yes, but uh, how many people have them? But sir, with all, with all of the problems going on in the world, the only thing that seems to affect you is is whether or not 90% of the people understand or don't understand a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon. Oh, my goodness, what a what a delightful life. Uh, don't you have any trouble making the mortgage payments or, you know, problems with a boss or, or some concern over homeless people or the environment? Uh, isn't there anything else in your life that matters, sir? Yeah, I, I work on a lot of different things. Funny, I only recall hearing from you on issues like this. Pardon me? I only recall hearing from you on issues like this. No. Which hasn't even, which haven't even been raised this I afternoon. A couple times ago, we were. this is the first time I've talked to you on this yeah. issue. Uh, I talked to you just recently about, um, what was it, children growing up without guidance and how the, uh, the poor don't have the opportunity, or, you know, or I should say it's the environment is a total influence on, on how the character of a child is, and, you know, made up. I mean, I, I understand that there are many issues in the, in the world. This was just one I was talking about misrepresentation by the media. Misrepresentation by the media. Of course, only half the people read newspapers. Contemplate that. That's one of the small pleasures of radio news. You don't get ink stained. Welcome back, Fun Seekers. On Wednesday, January the 24th, 1990, Lasseter with you at WLS Talk Radio, 890, Chicago's Talk Station. Segment number two and a half, I guess. 
In this hour on the long distance line, I have a guest. His name is Ambassador Zudi Terzi. I hope I said that at least close to correct. Did I, Ambassador? Of course you did. Okay. Ambassador Terzi is the PLO observer at the United Nations. Uh, let's get right down to business. In your view, the Israelis murdering thugs who are out to destroy uh, the innocent Palestinians or something else? Well, the Israelis make no secret about it. They want to get rid of all the Palestinians in all of Palestine. And they call the system the transfer system. Well, how would they like to get rid of them? You mean something like a holocaust? Well, I mean, it would be virtually a holocaust, yes. Oh. They, may, no, they may not eliminate them in the gas chamber, but they want to uproot them and throw them out of their homes and send them uh, maybe across the river into the desert. And the Palestinians have utterly, you know, no, no blame in this whatsoever? Well, the Palestinians want to stay in their own homes and live at peace. Well, there seems to be a, a disagreement here. The Israelis think it's their home. And the Palestinians think it's their well, home. I, I really don't know who thinks. I mean, if somebody was born there and his great-grandfather was born there and he had been there living all the time, he had planted the trees and had uh, sowed the seeds for uh, vegetations and built houses. So I don't see how anybody can claim he it doesn't belong to him. Well, it goes back a few more generations than that. Obviously, at some time they weren't there and these well, I mean, were. Uh, come on, I mean, they were there all the time. Even before Abraham came from the desert to settle there, the Palestinians were there. They're still there now. And they are still there now and they are determined to stay there. And they have what rights, if any, uh, under the Israeli system of government? Well, they are, uh, a, in, uh, in a greater part, they are under uh, military occupation. So what rights they have, they don't. Can they, can they hold jobs? Well, they can work and be exploited, but they cannot have their trade unions to defend them. Can they own their own homes? They uh, do own their own homes because they are on their homes. But what, ha what is happening is that they are being deprived of all civil rights and political rights. They cannot have their own self-determination declared. And Can they run for political office? No, they don't. They don't? No. There aren't any Palestinian mayors? There are Councilmen? mayors who are mayors, not because the Israelis help them to be, and that uh, mayor is not a political post, it's an administrative post. And now the Palestinians say they want to exercise their political rights, choose their own government, and have their own system, and have their own state. Have the Palestinians over the years uh, made some very unkind remarks about the Israelis, like oh, how lots, they should be... Lots of unkind remarks, of course uh -huh. they made unkind... How they, they should be... some unkind action. But uh, well, don't, don't the you, is, uh, don't you understand how the Israelis might, you know, st still kind of remember that and, and not be too fond of it? Well, of course the, uh, the Israelis can remember it, and we hope they still remember that uh, they cannot really deprive us of our rights and private of our homes and we just give them a red carpet service we fight back we are fighting back we're not fighting but we're fighting back are the palestinian citizens of the world i think so that's you know, kind of a dumb question they are citizens of the world right everybody is a citizen of the world and as such they have certain inalienable rights like the right to live wherever they'd like to live right they have the right to live primarily in their own homes yes and uh, it should should they decide that they are not happy where they are living, so at their own free will, they can move and go wherever they want? Uh -huh. They should be able to do that. Well, then I guess the Israelis have, in essence, the same right. Well, the Israelis have the right, of course. I mean, that's why we say if the, Isra if the Israelis are not happy with Israel, they can go anywhere they like. They can even come to the States. Why not? Well, they could even stay in Israel. Well, we, nobody is forcing them out, but not at the price of throwing me out. No one is forcing them out? You wouldn't like to see the Israelis go away? No, they, we have made it very clear that there is plenty of room for all of us, even for the two states, not only for the people to live in that territory, that there is plenty of room where we can both exercise our sovereignty, each in his own part, and get together. How many Palestinians are there in Israel? Well, in Israel, there are about 800,000 Palestinians, and under Israeli military occupation, there is something like 1.6 million Palestinians. So okay. all told... Uh, and here I draw a difference, because the 800,000 Palestinians are, who are Israeli citizens uh, do have rights as citizens, although there are some restrictions. 
But 1.6 million Palestinians are still governed by the military authorities. Okay, so they're, they're what, 1.6 plus uh, point well, 0.8 I mean, million? by this time, uh, since we started the chat, maybe they were increased by a few more, yeah. So, so, so what, roughly 2 million Palestinians, 2.5 million, how many? Well, I mean, I said 1.6 million Palestinians live okay. in the occupied territory under occupation. All right, and there are roughly, what, 3 million Israelis, something like that? Uh, there are about 3.5 million uh, Israelis or 4 million, yes. Okay, 3, 4 million Israelis, a uh, little, little better than 1.5 be million. Well, it seems to me that the Israelis are in the majority, and it would seem to me that the Palestinians would be uh, kind of foolish to assume that they're going to get some type of majority rule without a majority. Well, they are not claiming any majority rule. The Palestinians are saying, let this state of military occupation terminate. Let the occupying power the, withdraw from the occupied territory, and then they can have their own co government. Did it ever dawn on you that maybe the Israelis would like to end the military uh, uh, the military occupation, well, you know, I maybe put their did. money into something else? I wish they did, but having something like 40,000 Israeli troops in that occupied territory in order to uh, suppress the people under a label called keeping uh, law and order, I think uh, the Israelis, I am sure that the Israelis would not like to see their own children carrying their machine guns and going around the street. They would much rather see their children live in peace. I'd with like their Palestinian neighbors. Boy, I would imagine the same thing too. Then, then why don't the Palestinians make peace with the Israelis? Well, this is exactly what we have been doing. We have. Uh, it is. We have said it very clearly. At least uh, we have said it very clearly uh, in what we call the peace initiative of November '88, which was presented to the General Assembly of the UN. And it received 151 votes in support of that initiative that uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis, under the auspices and with the support of the Security Council of the United Nations, we should get together and start peace negotiations. Well, to the best of my knowledge, every day for the last couple of years, maybe there have been a day or two when this didn't happen, but to the best of my knowledge, every day in the occupied territory... Yes. The Palestinian people have encouraged their young, their young people, their children, sure. to go out and throw rocks at, to harass, oh, and to, uh, to incite to the Israeli soldiers. That doesn't sound very will, smart to me. They will continue to do that. After all, I mean, what do you think uh, they will do? They would permit the occupation troops to stay there uh, and uh, be happy about it? No, we want... Our people are determined to let the Israeli occupation troops feel very unhappy, very, very molested, and uh, also uh, that they get some kicks every now and then. I mean, knowing no full well that the Israelis are going to respond, knowing full well that Palestinian children are dying, knowing full well that Palestinian children are having their bones broken, their spirits broken. Uh, no, that, the spirits that, are not broken. The bones are. Yeah. Well, that doesn't doesn't seem to me to to be a a, a, a gesture of peace. All right, what is the gesture for peace? The gesture for peace is that the Israelis should come to the negotiating table and say, listen, we will withdraw, let's talk about the withdrawal process, and uh, by the time we reach an agreement, you remember, you see, in, you, have, you have very short memory, apparently. You were negotiating with the Vietnamese for years, while the Vietnamese bombs were uh, killing your uh, tens of thousands of your troops. During the negotiating process, you... At that time, both sides showed some interest to bring peace. In this case, that we have on the Palestinian territory under occupation, we have a plan, we have a project, which was supported by 151 of the member states of the UN, which says that the parties to the conflict should sit at the negotiating table. Now, once that starts, I'm sure there will no longer be stone throwing and there will be no longer shooting. Well, Ambassador Tarzi, I'm sure that that's the absolute truth. But let's let's be honest with each other. We live in we live in a a world that is not exactly ideal, and you have every reason to suspect that as long as the unrest continues in the occupied territories, that the conservative element of the Israeli government is going to have the upper hand in the running of the country. Well, I mean, if they and they're not going to go to the peace table. Well, if they, if they, if they want it this way, I mean, we have no other no choice but to... Yeah, you, you do have another choice. And, you, and your, you other choice, your other choice is to be even more strong, even more dignified, and do what you know is going to break the back of the conservative element in the, in the country of Israel and bring well, them to I the peace table. I don't know who is a conservative element in Israel. The minister of war, I mean, the minister of so-called minister of defense, is from the socialist party. Well, well, he may be, but he ain't the guy in charge, and you know that as well as well, I do. I, mean, I thought it was a democratic government, that's what you call. And since the minister of war or defense or whatever name you give him, 
is running this show and sending his troops to break the bones, look, for more than 20 years, our people were acting in a very docile and subdued way. But then... Which 20 years did you have in mind? Huh? Which 20 years did you have in mind? This Israel occupied the territories in 1967. Since 1967, the last 20 years, the, the Palestinian movement has been very docile? There it was docile. Of course, there was no uprising, and the uprising of this boys throwing, throwing stones only took this magnitude uh, since December 1987. Well, then who, may I ask, was, was coming into the country and blowing up buses? Who, may I ask, was going around the world and blowing up uh, airplanes? Mean, it was not. I mean, you say, what do you say? I mean, you send troops, you occupy the land, and you want us to say welcome to you? No, we won't. I'll tell you that. Well, I, I, I beg your pardon. When you blow up an airport in, you know, Rome... Well, yes, I mean, uh, there were cases where, where some Palestinians, and I underline some Palestinians... Some Palestinian groups have committed such acts, and there is, uh, I, I don't deny that, they, yes, they did. Well, after well, all, you have to, if you have to think of the genesis, why this all happened, I mean, you don't expect a full, an entire nation being dislodged and thrown away from their homes to sit down happily and uh, let the occupiers happy. But now, well, as an example, sir, in this country, there are many United States citizens who do not enjoy the full fruits and and joys of living in the United States, but they don't, you know, they don't go to Ecuador and blow up an airport. No, but what they do is they show, they have the right to show a, a political expression, and if they choose the wrong man, that they are to blame, but what happens with the Palestinians, they even don't have that political right of going to elections and choosing their representatives. They are subjected to alien rule. So terrorism kind of justifies the oh, fact no, no, that they no, can't no, vote. No, no, wait. I mean, don't make up words. I mean, I'm asking. Uh, there is no terrorism. There is resistance to foreign occupation, which is internationally acceptable. Well, wait a second. When you sneak across a border and blow up a a school or a or a well, bus or even somebody's some house, that's not terrorism. Well, there were that's some political acts, expression. Wait, 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 don't make up issues. There were some acts which. For example, when some uh, some criminal dropped some bombs in the synagogue in Istanbul, uh, I thought this was one of the meanest and most heinous acts to do, which were uh, against the Palestinians to start with. I mean, what do the Palestinians benefit from somebody blowing a synagogue in Turkey? Well, what, what about the acts of violence perpetrated against just run-of-the-mill citizens in the nation of Israel? Well, I mean, such acts happen. I mean, there was a state of war, huh? There was? Oh, well, of course there was. I mean, there was occupation and there was no peace. Now, what one has to go Well, most through, civilized nations do not attack civilian populations. Yes, come on. I mean, let me tell you this. I mean, way back, even before Israel was proclaimed as a state, the Jewish armed gangs blew up the administration offices of the mandated government, the King David uh, Secretariat, and they blew up a, a ship that was carrying uh, Jewish refugees from Europe, the Patria, they blew up and killed the innocent Palestinians in the area scene. I'm not going into that history now. I'm going into a fact, as you said, they are not happy to see their children carrying their guns and shooting at Palestinian boys, and we're not happy seeing our boys throwing stones at them. Well, somebody's got to stop this nonsense. Uh, right, and if they're not going to stop it, why don't you? That's what we say. We say, all right, come on, let's go to the negotiating table and start the peace, folks. Oh, but we're going to continue to do these things uh, until then. Well, I mean, as long as there is an army suppressing the people, they are not going to keep quiet about it, of course. But once, once the moment comes when Israel will say, all right, we agree to the negotiating table, to go to the negotiating table, then we say, all right, in the light of this new development, there will, by necessity, some reaction will be taken there and things will be subdued. Ambassador Tarzi, my guest, the ambassador is the PLO observer to the United Nations. Ambassador, if I ask you to hold on for a moment while I take care of some business here. Uh, also, let me give you the telephone number if you'd like to join in on the conversation. 591-8900-591-8900. There's a winter storm watch for late tonight and tomorrow. It'll be cloudy with snow developing tonight. Could be mixed with some rain. Snow, windy, colder tomorrow, an overnight low of 32. Mercury won't get too much of a workout tomorrow, a high of 33. Right now, 45. The official temperature, 46 degrees along the lakefront. WLS Skyview traffic with Bill Keller is next. Th is beyond or a little more educated than the average. And it is your job on this broadcast that you have to see to it that the American government joins with the other four members of the council to get the parties to the conflict and say enough is enough. Again, and, and this is exactly how you can help the cause and help your taxes. 
Again, Ambassador, allow me to ask you to wait while I take care of some business here. Uh, the telephone number five nine one eight nine zero zero. We will go to the telephones when we come back from this break. The community in the world, including the United States, say that this is a territory under foreign occupation and the occupying power should withdraw. So I'm not saying it just as a Palestinian. Even Israel itself, I don't know if you realize this, even Israel itself does not refer to those territories as part of Israel. They refer to them as the administrative uh, territory and not as part of sovereign Israel. So Israel admits this is not part of Israel. So why do you in the state, as a citizen of the world, quote unquote, you claim that we're throwing them out? We're not. They say it doesn't belong to them. To so Berwin we go. Hi, Berwin. You're on the air at WLS. Mr. Ambassador, how are you today? Well, I uh, thank you very much. How are you, sir? I am fine. I have a question, sir. When they uh, finally carved out the actual state of Israel, all right, I believe it was 1948, okay? Uh-huh. That was considered Palestine at, at, at one time, correct? That was Palestine, yes. Okay, that was Palestine. All right. Now, if I may take you back a few thousand years, okay, when the Jews were taken into uh, bondage to Egypt, okay, yeah. uh, they were forcibly taken from their country. How did the Palestinians get to what was then Israel to occupy these vacant lands? Well, you seem to be confused because the Abraham came actually, I mean, Abraham did not belong to that area. He came all the way from the city of Ur. He came to Palestine, Palestinian territory. He was very well received. He went to Egypt. He didn't like it. He came back to Palestine and stayed there. But then there was some, a lot of things had happened. But the country had always, always had inhabitants there, even before Abraham came in. Okay, so then the Palestinians and the Israelis at the time of Abraham, when they were all there in this country, how did they get along? Well, I'll tell you this, I mean, I do remember, and it is on record, that until 1929, where we had always lived happily together. And when 1929, when the Israelis or the Zionist movement once they came out with a plan to uproot the Palestinians and replace them and make this Judenstadt, this, this, the state of the Jews, at the price of expelling the Arabs, that's when the conflict started. Okay, and, and in 1929 then, there was no sense of, uh, we can all stay here together, uh, regardless if it's called Israel or Palestine, uh, there was no great trouble before 29. How come we can't go back to 29 and just get everybody to say, you know, we're well, all here I, together, I really it's a nice know, country, I, let's stay here. Actually, uh, that the historic facts show that until 1929, there is a record by the, the British Royal Commission that says, at least for the 80 years, 80 years preceding 1929, there were no clashes between the communities in Palestine. Was Palestine a Muslim country? 1929. Was Palestine at that time a Muslim country, Muslim law? It was not Muslim. It was uh, a part of the first, uh, before 1918, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. And then, as of 1922, Palestine was placed under the British mandate. Well, uh, no, I appreciate that, but in terms of local law, a Muslim law? Well, I wouldn't say just the Muslim law. There is the Sharia Muslim law is forms one part of it, but then... Would I'm you have me believe that Jews lived happily under Muslim law? Let me carry on, please. I mean, I studied law. I mean, I was born in Jerusalem. I was raised in Jerusalem. I left Jerusalem when I was 32 years old. So I know the laws of Palestine. The laws in Palestine were giving uh, different communities, different uh, status, and that was not only for the Jews, but under the Ottomans, there were distinct laws and distinct treatments for distinct and different citizens. That was not only against the Jews, but it was also uh, some other communities were deprived of some rights. Well, then might it, might it be fair to say that it was in essence a segregated country? Well, uh, until uh, under the Ottoman occupation, it was a segregated country. But when Palestine... Well, well that's not living in peace. The British, the, the British mandate, uh, there were no separate laws. There was the laws in Palestine pertaining to all Palestinians, regardless of the uh, religious affiliation. But the British mandate has maintained, and it is still maintained, I think, that there are some personal uh, relations and some family laws of inheritance, etc., which each faction or each community has its, uh, applies its own laws to that. But civil laws, civil laws, 
are, and criminal law applies to all citizens equally. To the northwest side we go. Northwest, you're on the air at WLS. Hello? Hello, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah my name is Mohammed. I'm, I'm from Saudi Arabia. All right, that's the question. Uh, yeah, my, my wife called you last week. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, is, is to Bob, actually. Is what? Uh, to Bob. Yeah, what's the, what's the, what's the question? Go ahead, please. Yeah, the question is, Bob, what, uh, what do you mean by uh, civilized people? What do I mean by civilized people, sir? Uh-huh. What do you mean, what do I mean by civilized people? Yeah, uh, uh, you mentioned the word civilized people. What do you mean by that? Basically, people who respect each other. Who are on the night for your high arm in your own air, WLS. Go ahead, Arlington Heights. Yes, um, I have a question for the doctor. Yes. Uh, doctor, I want to know, um, do you see the resolution of the California state being solved any time in the near future? I am sure of that because I also uh, am human and I would like to see a solution to it for the sake uh, of myself, of my children, as well as for the sake of my friends and my enemies because this state of war which has been going on for more than 40 years is detrimental to all of us. And that's why I believe in the human nature and the human goodwill and I reckon that within Israel itself, you know, I don't know if you're aware that New Year's Eve, there were more about 30,000 people who built a human chain around the walls of the city of Jerusalem, saying that there should be peace in that country. Well, actually also, you know, those 30,000 people are Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, no, Palestinians, no. and people from the rest of the world. And so, peace is a must, and that's why I think with peace, and a prerequisite for that piece is that the Palestinians have their own state in their own country. Well, I see a lot of pictures in the paper about um, Israeli citizens uh, protesting the war. That's uh, right. Sympathetic toward the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause and what is taking place over there. And they have as much uh, problems with their government as we do here with our government. And that we don't... Well, they seem the to have more power. They seem to have more power. Okay, but I also recognize the fact that this country supplies a great deal of money to Israel. 1.8 billion, 5.5 billion, whatever the figures are thrown around, is staggering. And I am not... Through the time, my guest on the long-distance line, Ambassador Zudi Terzi, who is the PLO observer at the U.N. To a car phone we go this time. Hi, car, you're on the air at WLS. Hi, Bob, how are you? Fine, thank you. All right, Ambassador, how are you, sir? Well, I am uh, fine. I'm glad that people are interested to call us and seek some more information. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, I, I deal with hundreds of Palestinians in Chicago. And I, I hear about the atrocities that are going on over there to these people. The stories they tell me are terrible. Uh, I'm, what I really like to know is what do you what do you propose to be a solution to settle everything over there? Well, there is, uh, you know, I mean, not to oversimplify issues. There are two enemies in the battlefield: the Palestinians and the Israelis. They should get to the negotiating table. And to be realistic, we can think of one table, which is the table of the United Nations. You know, those five permanent members of the Security Council sit there and bring the parties to the negotiating table. And with, a, with some goodwill on both sides, uh, I'm sure that we'll find a solution. I, I you seriously, honestly, you think that the Israelis are going to give up land? Well, I mean, what choice do they have? That would the Israelis want to continue in this uh, unending and protracting state of war? It appears that way. Well, I mean, then I'm sorry for them. I so do I. Well, well, what it really amounts to, Ambassador, is that the the Palestinians say the, the the answer to peace is for the Israelis to do what the Israelis have said they will never do. Well, so I so assuming that, how about a compromise position? How about how about giving a little ground? Look, I mean, I tell you exactly that uh, what you said is not completely or entirely true. I mean, there are even members of the Israeli cabinet who now uh, agree, and even Mr. Paris himself says, that there is no way out except by talking to the Palestinians. And uh, uh, some other members say, talk directly to the PLO and let... Talking to the Palestinians, yes, sir. Capitulating to the Palestinians, well, no. I see, that's where you go wrong. I mean, why do you use the, that language? You talk to your enemy if you want peace. You don't talk 
uh, to someone else. Well, I appreciate that, sir. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you you right. were saying that this problem will be solved if the Israelis do what they say they have never, they're not going to do. Well, I mean, that's it. They have to talk to the enemy. We say we talk to the enemy. They say to, so we, they talk to us. Then we sit down and talk. So, so what's your opening salvo? They're not going to do the, what, what you want yeah. them to do. So what's your compromise I position? Think eventually they will feel that they should do it. To River Fires to go. Hi, River. You're on here at WLS. Hi, Bob. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Starzy. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be talking with you on the radio. I have. Well, you're welcome. I watched you many times on a couple shows and many television shows. And I like to say I happen to be from Egypt. And uh, I'm calling back to uh, the two feelings here. The first, I'm very uh, thrilled and uh, happy. So here are many people interested in uh, this topic and calling the ambassador. 20 years ago, you wouldn't even have dreamed that anybody would call to mention the Palestinians or the Arab cause at all. And you can understand that, Bob. Uh, at least yeah, I can understand it because of the position of the PLO at the time. That's no, why no, I can no, understand no, it. No, I dug up all the Time magazine and the New Newsweek magazine from 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, before even anything. The stereotyping of the Jewish people was applied to the Arabs. Okay, what I'm calling about now is to say that for the first time, some people at least have the honesty to face the problem and talk with uh, the ambassador. Whether That's because, sir, the American people are fed up with both sides. Right. It's not that they're coming around to the Palestinian position. They're not, sir. They're fed up with both sides. That's the thing. The thing is that the American people, Bob, uh, were not really well informed until uh, the oil embargo probably happened. And before, prior to that, when the lines in front of the gas pumps... Sir, don't kid yourself. The American people, I'm going to be honest with you, the American people couldn't care less about Palestine. They're just getting right. sick and tired of spending the money and sick and tired of keeping one eye open to see if the Third World War is going to start over there. You mean, That's what it amounts to, sir. You mean you mean spending the money at supplying the Israelis with the weapons and arms to... And the Egyptians, too. And now? Just now? Yeah. When did we start supplying the Egyptians with money? For quite some time, sir. No, but Egypt gets approximately two billion dollars a year. Excuse me. Excuse me. That is not just for the good black eyes of the Egyptians. Sir, I don't care if it's to buy popcorn with. It doesn't make any difference. No, it's a lot of money, and we're getting fed up with it. Excuse me, sir. I, Bob, I don't think you really know the fact. This aid, which amounts to two billion dollars to Egypt, Israel has paid much more than that per capita. I know that, sir. Just a second. I, I know that. Second. We all know that. And sir, we're fed Bob, up with it. Bob, can I explain one more thing? Sure, the sir. The $2 billion dollars that are paid to Egypt in aid has ties and has strings attached. Yes, they sir. So, does the, so does the money to Israel. Companies. It, it has... It has strings it to it with Israel, too, sir. On American products. Yes, sir. I, 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 I know American that, sir. Companies, both from I, American companies. I, I'm very well aware of that, sir, but it still goes to buy war materials and we're getting fed up with it. We, we're, we're it still comes out of my pocket. War. Whether it goes to, to Egypt or whether it goes too. to Bechtel, it doesn't make any difference to me, sir. It comes out of my pocket. Sir, we are all set up with the war. We are all set up. This is why... Then why in God's, God's name don't you guys stop them? It's as simple as that. Ambassador Tarzi, I thank you very much for being my guest this afternoon. You will excuse me if I'm a tad frustrated, won't you? I'm not a PLO lover. I'm not a, an Israeli lover. I'm just sick and tired of dealing with pig-headed people who won't give an inch and who could well end up annihilating each other and possibly end up dragging me into it, too. Just a little bit tired of it. And I suspect that maybe some of you are as well. Fourth hour yet to come. We'll celebrate in the fourth hour. Celebrate getting through the first three. All right. Celebrate not reaching through the phone lines and strangling that man. As well as some of the people who called him. On both sides. 591-890-0591-8900 is the number. I'm really ticked. Brief. One more hour yet to go. Please, whatever you do, don't venture very far. This is WLS Talk Radio 890. WLS Chicago. Welcome back to 
on speaker. Wednesday. Well, she was rich and from Chicago. The Brandon Brain Lady. John Brower, Tim Coles, Art Deneen, Bob Schumann, they're all lunatics. And I spent five and a half years of my life. And then I run into Ambassador Chair Seat. Never have I seen such a group of pig headed people as the Israelis and the Palestinians. Never! One group says you can have peace if you'll give us everything we want. The other group says you can't have none of it. Let's have peace. And nobody seems to realize that there's got to be something in between. And in the meanwhile, I'm being drained financially and emotionally. I'm tired of it. I'm sick and tired of it. So we're going to celebrate with open phones because I have somehow managed to maintain my sanity over five and a half years with an occasional outburst. Just an occasional outburst. Muffy, if you're listening, get the red wine and whiskey ready. Send us down to the door, man, to a car phone we go. I car you on the air, WLS. Hi, Bob. Hi. I'd like to point out to you that uh, the fact that you make your living hosting a talk show doesn't give you the right to speak for the American public on at least two or three occasions during this past hour, particularly right at the end. You uh, informed the ambassador that the American people don't care about... Uh, they the don't, sir. Right and wrong. The average American just doesn't give a damn about what's going on over there. He'd be hard-pressed to point it out on a map. I'm not sure that's true, but whether it is or not, you don't have the right, Bob, to speak for the American public. I don't speak public. for the American public, you sir. I said the clear. average American is fed up. You said very clearly that the American people believe such and such, and I don't, and I resent you speaking for me, and you don't speak for Well, then listen to Stephen the... Gary. To the north side we go. Hi, North. You're on the air at WLS. Hi. Um... Wow, well, Bob, after all that you've been saying, I'm so confused. But, uh... Again, the news and commercials always come in better. Stand by. For themselves would, would just assume that all the Palestinians march into the Mediterranean Sea and drown. No. No, no. of course not. Well, at least that's not my, my view of it at all. Um, and also, just one other point. Um, as far as the money that Americans are um, sending to Israel and to Egypt, but that started in 1974 with the Camp David Agreement. And part of that was is that the Israelis would have to give up the Sinai and that they would have to give up the oil that they found there, which at that time was able to fuel their whole economy. The Israelis had cities in the Sinai. The Israelis had, had um, bases in the Sinai. They gave it all up. And now America, part of that agreement was is that America, just at that time, in 1974, would start sending military aid to America... I, I think also part of that agreement was that the Israelis would find a solution to the Palestinian problem. I think that was also part of the agreement. Pretty sure it was. Well, um, as far as I know, it's Duke, that the treaty Bob, was between Israel and Egypt. It didn't deal with the Palestinians. Yes, I, I know it was between Egypt and Israel, and it was hammered out in Camp David with Jimmy Carter, and, and I know all of those facts, but I also believe... It had a great deal to do with Israel bending over backwards to find a solution to the problems in the area. And I and they and are trying, but the point that I'm bringing up is, Bob, is as far as money goes, America made an agreement with Israel when Israel gave up all of their oil, not a part of it. Sir, all well, of well, they may have made an agreement, and sir, there are absolutely no parties in this entire situation with clean hands. None. But the Israelis' hands are dirty. The Palestinian hands are dirty. The Arab world's hands are dirty. I'm not... They're all pig-headed, the unreasonable Bob, people. Bob, the point I'm bringing out is, is that you were saying before, is America, you and I, are troubled with taxes. We feel we're paying too much. I agree with you. What I'm saying is, is... America made an agreement. Israel gave up a tremendous amount in doing that. The um, if you want to, if you, America so doesn't to go, want to so I'm supposed to go broke, Israel, sir. So I'm supposed Bob, so I'm supposed to go broke. Bob, if America do, doesn't want to give Israel 
the money, so then why don't they give the Israelis back the Sinai? If everybody wants to go back on the treaties, so then... Well, are you an American, sir? Yes, I am. Well, then why do you keep talking in the third person about America? I haven't heard you say we yet. We, as far as taxes. <laughs> I'm an American, I pay taxes. Well, sir, what it boils down to is not what happened 40 years ago, or not what happened in 1974, or not what promises were made, or not what treaties were signed. What it boils down to is that peace is desperately needed in that area. And what it boils down to is the reality that the average American is getting pretty damn fed up. And when the average American gets pretty damn fed up, he's going to put enough people in Washington to cut them off. Cut off the Egyptians, cut off the Israelis, and let them fight it out. And no money. What, jerk? I just got finished telling you like I told that pig-headed Arab. The money's going to be cut off at some point. And when that happens, there will be outright war. It just matters the money, Bob. Don't much care for pig-headed Arabs, and I don't much care for pig-headed Jews. I'm going to say it to you one more time, boy. When the day comes when the money stops, both sides will feel threatened. Both sides will feel they will have to settle the problem once and for all, militarily, while they still have a couple of bullets left. It's human nature. And that day is coming. Next year, next decade, 50 years from today, I don't know when. And it doesn't make much difference to me. But the reality is that when that day comes, the Israelis will feel threatened, the Palestinians will feel threatened. I, I have to tell you the truth about that. I live here and I went to school here. And I read the papers and I listen to a lot of programs. And I don't think that if you eliminate the aid to Israel and Egypt, you'll solve the homeless. It's a political problem. And I don't Sir, think... you're right. It won't solve the problem of homelessness. And, and you're with right, all sir. due respect, I, I'm Israeli, you can tell by my accent. I would like to see a solution with the Palestinians. I'm worried about them. Then why don't you go back to Israel and work within your own government, work within your own people and try to find a solution rather than suggest that I and the rest of the American people just constantly fund this insanity in the Middle East. In her community, just like the guy in Indiana, and there's somebody in Massachusetts, and there's somebody in Alabama, and somebody in Florida, and somebody in New Jersey, and all of these somebodies out of the 250 million somebodies, the overwhelming majority of whom just frankly don't think about your problems over there, sir, but they are getting a little bit sick and tired of paying for them. I, I absolutely agree with you, except one comment about it, okay? You know, if just like there's a guy in Tel Aviv that doesn't give a damn about what's going on in this country. You're wrong. You're wrong. In our country, we never burn American flags. I didn't say you burned American flags, sir, but there's a guy in Tel Aviv that doesn't care about the fact that there isn't decent housing available in Worcester, Massachusetts. We do care about that. And I want sure. to... Uh, Bob, let me only tell you one thing about it, okay? Um, you have a problem with Japan, economic war, right? And no, sir, I have a problem with stupid Americans who continue to send their money to Japan. Okay, and the both American car, and that's the reason the guy in Indiana cannot afford or doesn't have a job, because it's easier to buy from Japan, is it cheaper to buy a Japanese product. But beside that, you still sponsor the security. They don't, they don't spend money on security, on their own security, American forces. Uh, first, first of all, sir, you're quite wrong. They spend, I believe the Japanese military budget is either fourth or fifth largest in the world. They spend in excess of 1% of their gross national product on their own defenses. We are not defending Japan, sir. Give me a break. We're in Japan so that we can be closer to China and closer to Russia when it comes time to attack them. You, you protect, you protect uh, the Philippines and there is no any country... Protect the Philippines? Are you crazy? You We're in the Philippines in, ca in case the Russians and the Chinese break our defenses in Japan. You have a forces in, in Philippines that cost you over two billion a year. Yes, sir, and they're not to defend the Philippines. To defend who? Us! Against who? Beats me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. 59189. Some of you are listening in Alabama. Where there are people who live in 
Homes that literally have dirt floors. And some of you are listening in Florida, where there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of elderly people in desperate need of medical care that's not available to them because they can't afford it. And at some point, I don't know when, but at some point, this country swings back and forth like a pendulum. And at some point, we're going to become much more concerned with our own domestic needs. Not because we're greedy people or selfish people, we're just people. And sometimes we're concerned with your needs, and sometimes we're concerned with our needs. And we have very serious needs in this country. And we also have some very large looming problems on the horizon that are going to require hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that we simply do not have. And at some point, we're going to be forced to address all of these problems. And at some point, we're going to be desperately looking for money. And at some point, we're going to look at budgets like uh, foreign aid. As a matter of fact, some people already are. And we're going to say, geez, it's our people or them. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Okay, it's our people. And at some point, we're not going to have the money to, to fund what has become a, a mutual assured destruction policy in the Middle East. We're going to pull a plug on everybody. Not because we want to sit back and see what's going to happen and watch it on the nightly news, but because we're not going to have any choice. And I know if I was an Israeli and that happened, and I thought the entire Middle East was going to go berserk and I felt really threatened, I would want my government to protect me. I would want my government to eradicate any possible enemy. An an enemy. And if I was a Palestinian and that happened, I would feel very threatened. And I would want my people to join with me and ensure our survival by eradicating our enemies, however we might be able to do that. So it would seem to me that if I was an Israeli and was realistic, or if I was a Palestinian and was realistic, I would look down the road at what could be next year or 20 years from now. What difference does it make? And I would say, Holy cow! Oh my God! I hadn't thought of it that way before. We better get together with these people over there on the other side and work something out before we kill each other. That's all. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't it make a hell of a lot more sense than worrying about a treaty that was signed in 1974 and saying, well, geez, you have to give us the money or give us back the oil? Or, or maybe something that happened in 1918 or 1929 or yesterday? Oh, to be sure, the Palestinians have done some despicable, horrible things to the Israeli people. Oh, to be sure, the Israelis have done some despicable horrible things to the Palestinian people. But at some point, you better forget it. You better move on. Both sides. Or else you're both going to end up dead. That's all. Let's take some more phone calls from friends and neighbors. Gary, you're on the air at WLS. Uh, Bob. Yes, sir. Oh, boy. Waited a long time to talk to you. Uh, I got a few things I would like to say to you, but I'd like to start off by sort of lightening things up. So I've got a few tongue-in-cheek remarks, and then I'd like to get into my main point. The first thing I'd like to say is that I'm going to start a Jim Johnson fan club to drum up support to counteract all the abuse that you give them. The second thing that I want to say is that I was, uh, I was surprised to see uh, your picture in the Tribune and because that's because uh, I had visualized you to look more like uh, Jim Morrison based on uh, the sound of your voice that I got over, over, over the radio but at any rate this is uh, this is an open line right and yesterday I wanted to uh, address the issue about the death penalty that you had addressed are you there? Yes, sir. I'm contractually obligated to be here until 7. All right. 
Yesterday, I um, I wanted to address the issue um, uh, from you know critique your point of view about the death penalty, but I didn't get a chance. So I would like to make a point today about it, and that is one thing that I think you have overlooked in your um, in your opinion about uh, people who grow up in uh, deprived. Uh, environments which uh, lead them to become murderous is that a human beings are not deterministic we have been endowed with a will and we are made in the image of a creator tell you what sir as soon as you can prove to me that god gave you a free will i'll change my mind on the death penalty kenilworth hi you're on the air wls uh yes mr lassiter I am a young high school student, and I don't really have... I'm not really well educated on the Middle East problem. However, it would seem to me that if we are the funders of, of uh, part of the crisis, that we, some of the blood is on our hands as well. And we are equally responsible. While, they, while, they may be, while the Israelis may be pig-headed, and the, uh, the, the Palestinians may be pig-headed, and uh, that, is, that's a, that is a fault of theirs, our lackluster, careless attitude about how we spend how we spend our tax tax money. We don't. They're they're both very independent people. Uh, well, they, they don't dance at the end of our string any more than anybody else dances the end end of someone else's string. Okay, and one one more question. It's sort of off. It's sort of not really uh, related. But could you uh, explain to me the difference between the Sunnis and the Shiites? The difference between them? Between a Sunni and a Shiite. Uh, Can't really explain the difference between them, except that I can tell you why they dislike each other. That would, that would be... Uh, Basically goes back to about the year 800, when somebody's relative didn't get a job that they thought he should have gotten. And that's a, that's a simplification of the problem, but it, it's, it's in essence the truth. I believe it was about the year 800. Okay. Well, that's all I really They've hated each other ever since. Have a good night. Take care. Yeah. I know it sounds silly. Most disagreements are. Off it is to Graves Lake. Hi, Graves. You're on the air. Yeah, hi, Bob. Hi. Yeah, I think they have been an American. I think... Reasonable men who are moderate men who are genuinely looking for a solution. And let's be honest about it. There are some Palestinian people who have, who have come around that are becoming more moderate and more reasonable. But also, let's be honest, on both sides there are still a lot of pig-headed fools. Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree totally. And unfortunately, the pig-headed fools are still in charge. That's right. On both sides. Right. Well, I just wanted to call to say, you know, I think that your position does actually reflect what at least most of my friends and the people I know, they, you know, could care less one way or another. They get to the point where they're really tired of hearing about it. And I'm tired of seeing Palestinian kids taught hate. I'm tired of seeing Palestinian kids wasted. Absolutely. And I'm tired of seeing Israelis wasting their time and energy uh, when they should be making life better for their people. I want both people to have decent lives. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Bob. I don't think that's the way most people think. Thank you. Uh, that's usually what happens. Well, I just like to say that point. I just didn't understand why you were talking about Arabs and this and Adif. There's nothing we can do about it. Have a good night. Excuse me. That's why I've got the show and you don't. Palatine, you're on the air at WLS. Hi. Hi. I was uh, actually called in first because I wanted to talk to uh, Zudi Tarzi. And then I thought I didn't have anything to say, but, you know, one of the things that strikes me with all the calls that have come in since is that we're, we're dealing with Egypt because they can no longer feed themselves. They bred themselves beyond the capability. That's all. We're, de we're dealing with Egypt to, to buy them off from attacking the Israelis. And we're dealing with the Israelis to buy them off from attacking the Egyptians. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. One of the things that struck me when uh, uh, Tarzi was talking was, you know, just kind of ignoring the violence zone, such as uh, such as Arab the PLO or Begin, as well as the Cam Punky on both sides, who would like to terrorize the innocent to make uh, political statements. I was I was thinking about he was talking about the fact that were I think he said three and a half million in uh, Israel. Yeah. My almanac I think said something like four and a half million in a in a, in a land area about the size of New Jersey. Well, it's a three and a half million Israelis and roughly a million point six Palestinians. Well. Uh, 
Well, I think what he said was that the fact that the spirit, the spirit of Daytona between uh, the Russians and us, they can't afford it either, and they're pumping big bucks in there, and they have been for a long time. No, they're not, really. Not anymore? No. I they were. The only place they really ever had a terribly strong foothold was Egypt, and Egypt picked them out. Hi. Yes, this is uh, Peoria. Yeah, I want to make one simple comment that, uh, again, I'm one of those average people, a person from Peoria, the comparative uh, hearing about these problems, and, and I'm 101% on your side, Bob. And I consider myself pretty average. Uh, I'm, I'm a college student. I'm trying to get into business of my own, starting from ground zero. And another thing is, uh, I'm tired of the, it. seems like I'm getting a lot of partial people listening to them over the phone, the conversation stuff, that some way or another they've gotten over here and they've missed their boat back, it seems like. And they come over here and they voice their opinions and stuff and try to make little changes within our system and they try to explain, well, like I said, the simple comment is I agree with you 100% and uh, I'm behind you, Bob. Thank you very much. Bet. Oh, mercifully, mercifully, mercifully. It's brings us to the end of yet another program. <clears throat> I, I, I never expected to get uh, to get emotional and and to give a damn about the guy yesterday from the tenants union. You know, I thought that was going to be primarily a lot of little old ladies calling up saying, "Oh, the landlord's bad." You know that kind. Of, and I never really expected today to get very emotional about talking with Ambassador Tarzi. Because, you, you see, I'm like a lot of Americans, and, and while I care, I, you know, I, I, I got a lot of other things on my mind, you know? you know? I'm writing macros for my computer, and, you know, and I, geez, I got this to worry about and that to worry about. And I don't find an awful lot of time thinking about, or an awful lot of time to think about, the Palestinian and the, and the Israeli problem. But, boy, when I do. It's very, very frustrating. And I, you know, I basically tend to to get rid of something when it when it frustrates or bothers me. I'm a human being, and a lot of other human beings tend to do the same thing. And I think that the PLO as well as the Israeli government might do well to remember that. Tomorrow at three. Love you, Chicago. <laughs>